We got a few more seats up front in the front row. If you can make your way in, we're going to get started in another minute. All right, we're going to get, get rolling here. There are still more seats up front if anybody's looking for a spot. Head up here. Well, let me be the first to welcome you to Capgemini's Applied Innovation Exchange. My name is Joe Bojo. I'm part of the leadership team here at the exchange. Uh, I always ask this question. I know I see so many familiar faces, so you, you, those of you who've been here know what's coming next. So just by show of hands, how many first timers do we have to what's now this evening? Solid. It gets bigger every week, every month. So thank you for, for those of you who are joining for the first time. And, for the first timers, I wanted to give a little bit of uh, context, one on, on who Capgemini is, what we do here, and a bit of the origin story that sits behind this thing that is called What's Now. So uh, Capgemini is a, a global consultancy based in Paris, uh, about 200,000 employees. We consult on a whole host of different things. And uh, in the course of our journey as a consultancy, our problems, our clients' challenges have started to uh, take a more of an ambiguous form. And, and you know, they typically say we need to move faster or reinvent our culture or get into new business models. And as we started to bear witness to those things, we realized that we needed a different set of tooling to be able to support those clients in, in their journey. And that's essentially one of the things that we do in this space. So we call it an exchange because when a client has a an ambiguous challenge, we can't really solve it, we exchange. We interact with you know, many of you, in, in certain cases, members of this ecosystem and the community, and we talk about that, that challenge that they have and try to put some context to it. And then the other thing that we do is apply innovation to it. So how do you work differently to get the outcomes uh, that, that are needed? So happy to share more about that with you as we, we get into the evening here. Uh, we've been uh, here for over three years now and doing what's now for, for that uh, the bulk of that time. And when we first got into this region, we were kind of a, you know, somewhat of a, a new brand in the region. We've been in this region for, for you know, over 15 years. But when we began to think about having a different kind of presence in the region, uh, one of the things we, we realized, well, we, we need a way to engage different constituencies in the community here and, and constituencies that we don't really know. So startups and investors and entrepreneurs and the like, people that really had never gotten exposed to our brand before. And in that journey, when we were kind of curious about what could we do to, to open ourselves up and, and really bring the community in, uh, along the way, we had a great fortune to meet Pete Layden, who you'll, I'll, I'll hand the mic to in a second. Uh, and, and Pete's a, a native of this area and worked at, at Wired for a long period of time, had a lot of connection and, and authentic connection in this region. And we brainstormed with Pete and came up with this concept of what if we could bring amazing speakers in to talk about what's going on right now in, in the community that we, we care about, and we could bring in relevant constituents to that, that conversation. So tonight, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the world of mobility and autonomous vehicles. Not the first time we've talked about transportation here. We had Sunil Paul, we've had uh, Johnny Dyer talking about transportation to orbit, you know, and, and space travel. So this category is incredibly uh, interesting and salient for us. And being a Detroit kid, I, I love auto and, and, you know, seeing where this stuff is going. So um, one, one last thing I'll say is I, I did a quick, we, we haven't done this before. I just, I wanted you to know a little bit about who all is sitting around you, because part of the reason that we do this is the concept of exchange. So we'll talk about some amazing things, but after the fact, we want you to network and, and connect with each other, because you're, you're all at the formative stage of this amazing uh, industry intersection. So with us tonight, we have players from Panasonic, Ford, Audi, Lyft, Volvo, TomTom, Shell, Cruise, and, and I left several off on this. So if you think of that collective you know, innovation portfolio that you all have, some, some pretty amazing conversations can be had uh, after the event. So the last thing I'll say is uh, it's been a while. Right, Last time we did this was November. We did two in November. Uh, we're going to move to a quarterly format this year. So uh, we'll soon announce the, the, the next date and the next uh, subject. But uh, beyond that, nothing's really changed. Same, same format, uh, just different timing. So look forward to talking to you all more tonight. I'm going to hand it over to Pete Layden to uh, drive the rest of the evening and, and, uh, and looking forward to the conversation with Tim. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Gap Gemini. Um, really, this series, 
would not have happened without the absolute uh, full support and, and the energy, the resources, and the creativity of the Capgemini crew. So I personally have been really thankful, and I, I hope that you all are too. Um, now, it wouldn't be a series on innovation, uh, you know, wouldn't be uh, appropriate to just be doing the same thing over and over again. And so now it's been three years. It's literally almost to the month, three years since we launched this series. Uh, we've expanded to New York, uh, as some of you know, uh, where I also host that out there with Capgemini. And um, we've done, literally, it's getting close to now, we're approaching 50 of these over time. Um, and so with the start of the 2019 season, we're going to do some things differently. Joe mentioned some of them, but for example, some of the old timers will realize, um, new logo. And the logo, one of the reasons behind this is the, uh, the what's now has now spread to innovation exchanges that Capgemini runs uh, all over the world. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the stuff that we do here and a lot of what we're even doing tonight are going to be seen and people can actually tune into it and also see what's happening in all these other uh, what's now is all over the place. So again, the branding is shifting. Um, as you saw, you're now registering in the Capgemini world. We're going to be live streaming now this new live stream. If you do send it out to anyone, it's coming to the Capgemini stuff. So there's a kind of a, a shifting a little bit as, as we kind of mature this series. Uh, but a lot of it is the same. Uh, and with that, uh, Joe mentioned it. We are essentially doing the three camera shoot here, which is going out to the world here. So by the way, when you do your questions and answers, you are on, uh, on camera and it's gonna stick out there. I'm gonna be maintain being the host. It's still the same kind of format. We're gonna have really the conversation with you for the second half of this conversation is all part of the 90 minute program. And that's some of the best stuff. Uh, and so there's very similar things and there are some different things. Uh, now one of the things that is the same is we are getting world class thought leaders, really, to start these conversations. Uh, and we're doing the topics that are really the most relevant, most pressing, most interesting topics in, of the innovation going on in some of the most important fields in the Bay Area here. And uh, tonight is no exception on that one. Uh, really, tonight, you're not only going to get one field or one topic, you're going to get a triple whammy. Uh, we're going to really be talking about what is essentially three revolutions going on around us in transport. The shift to the sharing, the sharing kind of sharing vehicles, essentially, the Lyft, Uber kind of world. We've actually got people from Lyft here and other places. Uh, that's one big shift. We're kind of well into that. Then there's a the shift to electric vehicles. Tesla and others, there's folks from the electric kind of world even here. Uh, I actually just joined that myself, just with the latest Model 3. I'm, I'm now one of the half a million folks that are essentially now moving that direction. Um, but the big one that's really out there is autonomous vehicles. And what's interesting about tonight is we're going to treat all three at the same time because all three of them are going to essentially go through an absolute transformation in the next 10 years, and we've got to actually think of them in sync. We've got to think of them as one comprehensive whole. And to do that, we've got a great person to lead this conversation, Tim Papandreou. Now, Tim um, is interesting because he actually has just recently come out of Google X and Waymo, which is folks know, has actually been really on the forefront of autonomous vehicles, so he kind of gets the technology. He's been spent the last couple of years in that space. He also though, comes out of the public policy world. He was the uh, innovation, uh, chief innovation officer of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, so he gets what's going on inside public policy. And that dance between public and private policy is really going to be essential in these next 10 years. Uh, he's also co-founded a, a nonprofit startup called City Innovate. Uh, in which you, you city governments are being connected to innovative small startups to kind of drive innovation more in cities. He kind of gets that kind of world. And he also has his own kind of company now as the founder of the Emerging Transport Advisors. And so he's been going all over the world actually telling people what the heck we have to do here coming up here. So what we're going to do is have him come out and give an overview of his kind of insights into the whole field, this triple whammy field. I'll come up as usual, I'll tease out some early questions that kind of integrate it and start moving towards you. And then as he, Joe mentioned before, we have so many great brains in here in this space, we'll have a conversation with all of you. And with that, let's welcome Tim for, uh, welcome Tim to come up. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody, great to be here. I think I'm gonna stand over here to, so that it makes sense. Okay. Hi everyone, great to see you all. Um, I hate hearing my introduction, so uh, <laughs> just be aware of that. It's like, 
I'm, I'm my own worst salesperson, but it is what it is. But uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Pete, for organizing this and inviting me. You know, Pete's that kind of person that says, hey, Tim, do you want to do this? How are you going to say no to Pete? Go, yeah, sure, I'll come. No problem at all. Uh, but I just got back from Singapore and Hong Kong uh, yesterday, so I may be a little jet lagged. So let's just we'll run through this as, as, as we move forward. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of a big picture thing on what's happening in the world of, of mobility, tease out some key issues, uh, and then um, figure out some of the things that have not been addressed that really need to be addressed to move forward. So let's, let's go there. So this is, uh, you all should know this, right? This is uh, San Francisco. Uh, many people around the world are clamoring to understand what's happening in San Francisco because it's ground zero for so many things. Um, these are all my contact details and happy to chat with you uh, after th this. But what's interesting is what makes San Francisco unique is that it's not that it's smarter, better, or any of those sort of things. In fact, we have so many problems, it's actually quite shameful sometimes. It's our culture, it's true, it's our culture of trying and trying new things. That's what makes us different, because I get asked by every governor in the world, what's the secret sauce in San Francisco? And I said, we just accept everybody for who they are, no matter how obnoxious they are, to help us fix these problems, right? That's the key difference. And that, ma that pays dividends. And so when you think about what's happening in the world right now, we are turning into a planet of cities. And everywhere in the world is experiencing rapid population growth, whether it's in-migration, out-migration, or just natural increases. But at the same time, everybody's moving into cities all over the world. It's actually to a number of about 3 billion people over the next 25 years are physically going to be moving into cities. And there's no way we can accommodate all of that movement of people and things with our current transportation options that we have, especially the ones that are so fragmented and disjointed, um, just like the Bay Area has 27 transit agencies. That sort of stuff is just not going to work uh, in the future moving forward. Some things I'm going to tell you are going to be uncomfortable truths, but we need to actually address these things. Just like in therapy, you need to admit there's a problem and then move forward, right? <laughs> so, ever had spousal therapy, you together, couples counseling, I, I hear you, however, therefore, I, that sort of stuff. <laughs> That's the sort of stuff that we have to do moving forward. So, let's look at technology. Technology is amazing. It works when it works, and when it doesn't work, we get really frustrated. But without these four symbols, our mobility today and tomorrow will just not function. Whether it is uh, our digital uh, phone system, our GPS location, smartphones, and these things called APIs, which are application program interfaces. Without these four pieces, we can't do a lot of the things that we take for granted today, let alone the things that we'll need tomorrow. And then when it doesn't work, we have fits, right? So if we see these three symbols, um, most people who are under 25 see these three symbols, they literally get the, the jitters and the shakes. <laughs> so we can't rely on this tech. You know, when I worked at Google X, we used to say all the time, the best technology is a technology that works in the background. It's what you can't feel or see, but you're so glad it works. Wi-Fi is one of the best examples. We can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't feel it, but we know if it works, and we know when it doesn't work. So, that's the sort of stuff that we wanna, we, we're talking about. Technology does things to us that we think sometimes is the fault of the technology itself. Technology is a tool, it's not a thing. And how we utilize those tools is up to us as people. And I think that's something that's just very difficult to get our hands around. And here's a typical situation where I get told all the time, Tim, look at this technology, it's making us antisocial, we're not talking to each other, we're in our phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to myself, is it the technology or is it the actual environment and the space that we're in? Because I'm going to go back 100 years and we're kind of doing the same thing, <laughs> right? So here were our iPads, they were made of paper, they were really big, and we never actually talked with each other. So we're waiting for our ride. You know, this is, this is human in us, so we have to be very careful of when we blame technology. Yes, there are some things that are pervasive that we need to actually focus on, but at the end of the day, it's how we, we as the users of those services, uh, act. And then new technology gets a lot of uh, hard raps and say, oh, well, this new technology is awful. Look what it's doing to our cities. It's terrible. It's awful. Oh, it's amazing. It's the best thing since sliced bread. And again, what's new is old. What's old is new because this was here 100 years ago, right? So we had these scooters. And uh, for some reason, whether you believe in the conspiracy theories or not, they were taken out of operation within a couple of years. And we had lots of cars. That's all I'll say. So that was very interesting to see that. And what's interesting is that technology has been used to do many interesting things, not just to use things, but also to allow people to be empowered in ways that are not possible. These are electric scooter share companies in Manila and in Dubai, and their customers are people who are normally not users of these services or not allowed to use these services. So 
there's some liberating opportunities with this technology as well, if we know how to use it properly. So technology is everywhere now. It's very pervasive in our life. These symbols, uh, household names, you know these more than you know probably each other's neighbors uh, and, and, and everybody else around them. But these are interesting because they are the dominant force in each of these parts of our society, whether it's information, social media, retail, employment, entertainment, there's still a jockey between these two companies. This one, YouTube, uh, was watched by about one in 100 people a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of times a week, and now it's about one in four or five a day. It's the world's largest broadcaster, and what they all have in common is that they don't actually exist in the real world. They are basically... Um, uh, connectors or of information and services. Amazon's moving more into the real world, but that's a, that's a very different way of, of doing things. The next frontier is mobility. These tech companies are all looking at, well, what can we do about mobility? And what the difference is that all of these companies are a platform. And if you hear this word platform so many times, you would say, oh, what's a platform? All a platform is, is an intersection point between customers and producers. So producers of things or services and consumers of things and services, that interaction point is where the platform basically touches. And that touch is data. The more data the platform gets, the more knowledge it learns about its customers and its producers, the more it can start tailoring its services to know what's happening and what's going to move forward. The more data it gets, the more their algorithms build up, and the better the algorithms develop, the more they can start predicting what you will do next. This is why all these tech companies love being platforms, because they work, and they're working exceptionally well, almost too well if you ask some government regulators. So I'm now going to give you some investment advice. I, I work a, a lot with uh, venture capitalists and a lot of investors, and they come, come to us and say, hey, Tim, listen to this pitch, see what you think. So I'm going to give you a pitch. I'm going to ask you for $35,000 for an investment in something that needs $9,000 a year to operate every year, pretty expensive to operate for a $35,000 investment. It's going to only be used 5% of the time. Um, and there's about 20% capacity utilization, and the efficiency of this system is only about 20%, so other 80% of the energy is completely wasted. Its return investment is, mm, I don't know, maybe something, maybe nothing. Um, you probably will spend about $100,000 in, in the life of this product. Um, who wants to buy this? There it is. Who's ready to buy? But, yeah, but you do it all the time because we've suspended our economic re reality and we say yes to this product. If this was pitched to any VC, they would laugh them out the room. But for some reason, over seven decades, we've said this is actually worth it. So what happens? You get sold this. You are going to be the sexiest, coolest, funkiest person out there. You're going to get a really fast red car, and you're going to be able to drive on this beautiful Pacific Highway, and it's going to be gorgeous. You're going to get the guy. You're going to get the girl. It's San Francisco. You'll probably get both. So you know, <laughs> this, is the, this, is the, this is the world that you have. And you say, yes, I'm going to do that, even though I see all these numbers that I don't really like, because this is actually really cool. And you say, OK, I'm going to buy this. And then you get this. And you say, wait a second, I wanted that. Well, that's not my fault. I just make them. You know? And if you buy them all, it's your problem. So you know, we, have this, we have this situation here that we need to basically address. And the challenge is that you know, this is an outcome of policy. It's not the car maker's fault. It's not the car itself. It's not even the use, it's how we use the vehicles. That's, that's the challenge we have. And so this one-size-fits-all is just not going to work as, as we move forward. And you know, we have this situation where we, we have a lot of people saying, well, if we just switch to electric, everything would be much better. If we just switch to automated, it'll be much better. I'm changing the slide now to if this happened and changed to all electric. I just changed the slide. <laughs> Nothing changed, right? The air is a little better, and the, the air is a little cleaner. I'm going to just change it now to if all goes autonomous, just autonomous. Nothing happens, right? So this is not the solution. The solution is we have to think about this in a very different way. And here is why we have the reason we have congestion. People know congestion. They hate congestion. This is the typical what we call a, a wolf diagram or a dog diagram because it has two dog ears and the two eyes. Basically, the morning peak and the evening peak and the frustrated commuter there. All of this is because of work culture. Our work culture requires us to do this. This is where we have congestion. Any manager in the room who has a staff of more than three people, you don't need them to come to the office every day. You expect them to come to the office because you have some sort of insecurity complex issue that you need <laughs> butts on seats, right? But we actually don't need to be at the office. And I'm not talking about the service workers or the people who need to actually make things or the people who actually need to be there to service whatever it is to do. I'm talking about the professional people who are not 
uh, having to actually do anything other than have an internet connection. There is no need to be at work five days a week. And if we did that, and we did nothing else, there would be no congestion. It has nothing to do with infrastructure, nothing to do with cars. It has to do all about our work culture. It's our culture that causes a lot of these issues, not the infrastructure or the service that we have. Let that sink in for a second. And then we have this amazing smartphone that's made us incredibly dumb, um, and we keep doing this everywhere. We're just walking around like this, not paying attention to anything. And we've got to the point where we're basically past the point of being able to operate machinery. You know, the person on the left, the worst thing they're going to do is they're going to hit the head on a pole. You've seen all those YouTube clips. They fall in lakes, they fall in reservoirs, they fall in rivers. <coughs> this person kills people, and that's not cool. So we need to shift the focus on people who are doing this in their vehicle versus people who do that on the sidewalk. So we have a lot of issues with, with how we use our cars, and the way the cars are currently set up is just not, not helpful for anyone in society. Three quarters of our world's air pollution is because of, of urban air pollution, is because of the, the way that the propulsion technology we have in our cars. People, not cars, people kill 1.2 million people every year, and the media always says, car killed person. No, it didn't. The person driving the car killed the person. Um, and I think we need to shift that responsibility back onto, onto people. We spend 10 days of our lives every year in cars. 10 days. Most Americans get 10 days of vacation. So you get 10 days. Sorry, Europeans, you get four weeks, but uh, Americans get 10 days. So yeah, let that one sink in for a second. Um, so you get 10 days. And then 15% of our population is not able to maintain a full-time job because they can't operate a vehicle because of physical or invisible disabilities. And that means they're left out of the economy. That's 15% of adults just in across the nation, in some pockets, in some areas, as high as 30%, depending on the way that the system's set up. So we've got some real challenges to deal with. Luckily, this whole, I own my car, I use a fossil fuel vehicle, et cetera, is starting to sunset, and what's starting to sunrise is the multimodal shared uh, system. But I say sunset because it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It's a sunsetting period over, over at least a decade, and this sun rises in, in emergence um, over the next decade as well. So we're going to see... Uh, a lot of mixing in between, which is causing a lot of this conflict that we have right now. And so, as, a, as a Pete mentioned, the three core trends that are going to shake this whole system up for the good or for the better or for the bad or for the ugly, depending on how we want to deal with this, is the concept ideas around sharing, uh, not just shared rides, but shared fleets, which is a really big shift, uh, electrification of everything that's motorized, and um, automated uh, vehicle technology, which could be anything, that, and I'll talk about it in a second. And so we are seeing this happen very quickly. This is the number of electric scooter sharing companies in the world right now. There are more than 50, and they are everywhere. I just, I've met with almost all of them, um, and it's amazing to see how quickly and agile they are because the vehicle type, the device, is so small and nimble, they can scale very quickly. Of course, they've, they've run into issues around the world, but there's really good um, uh, ideas moving forward. We are going to see a big shift from shared electric and automated, not just in the passenger world, which is on the left-hand side, but also the, the logistical world, which is on the right-hand side. So both passenger and freight are going through this tremendous shift at the same time. And this shift is happening so fast that even people like myself, who this is their job to watch it, we can't keep up. It's just moving so quickly, and luckily now people are telling me what's happening. I'm like, whoa. So it's, it's, in, a, it's in a way that's moving in every direction, and the focus underneath both of these is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It's how do we make the system more efficient? And speaking of efficiency, this is why these shared mobility, uh, electric mobility companies are really coming to the fore, is because the average uh, trip length in the US of five miles or less can easily be done without a car. And two-thirds of all our trips in the US are five miles or less, and only a third of our trips are between six and 25 miles. So that's what tells you why so many people are clamoring around this opportunity to figure out how do they peel that market share off the personally owned vehicle and onto these shared mobility uh, devices because they can do it better, faster, cheaper, and, and all the other things that we care about. And then for the longer distance trips, a lot of these new car rental services, whether they are existing or the startup versions, are really starting to peel away the need of, okay, I need my car for X, Y, and Z, and as you start peeling it back, you realize, well, actually, I don't need my car. 
I just want my car because I want to look better than everybody else, right? So it's not, an, it's not a need to get from A to B, it's a need to look better than everybody else. That's what really we're having to fight with. And it's a, it's a cultural thing. It varies by culture, and I think it's just a reality. But in many parts of the US and around the world, you actually do need a car because there are no good enough options that you can rely on. And that's a reality that many of the progressive transportation planning policy team have to deal with. We have not provided the services that people actually need to make those shifts. And so when you think of it from a technology perspective, technology kind of is saying, I get it. I can thread the needle across all of these modes. I can link them with all of my back-end technology, and I can make this system work as one system, and I can capture this market. When you add up all this stuff worldwide, all the world's number of trips and the cost of our transportation system worldwide, there's a market potential by several estimates of around $10 trillion by 2035. That's not a small amount of money, just letting you know. The, be the best sales of, of iPhone don't even get into the hundreds of billions. This is $10 trillion worth of market opportunities. So again, this is the totality of it. Doesn't mean it's going to be easily won by anybody, but it's going to be a, a process in why all these companies are working behind this. There's an interesting concept here called mobility as a service, where you link all these systems together. That's actually the first step. These technology companies want to do a lifestyle as a service. Google Assistant or anybody's service links to your calendar, tells you when your meeting is, organizes the trip type for you, gets you on your ride, gets you back home, you go to the movies, the popcorn's waiting for you, eat, you have the movie, eat the popcorn, it takes you back home. That's the kind of lifestyle as a service that, that some of these tech companies are talking about, because they want to capture the whole thing, not just the, the transport piece. And so when we talk about automation, Automation comes down to three key pieces of this. It's the movement of people, the movement of things, and the doing of things. And the doing of things has the least sexy headlines because no one wants to know that there's a, there's a robot automating mining or agriculture or, or construction or any of the back-end things that you just take for granted. Those things are, gonna, are, gonna, are what are going to make our economies keep moving. But it's the movement of things and people that get a lot of the attention. And the movement of things is actually relatively hard, but simpler than moving p people, because this thing doesn't care how it gets from A to B, as long as it gets there, and if it's late, it's late, whatever, you'll, you'll get it, right? But people are super sensitive. I worked on this for a couple of years, and things like time of arrival, and the route, and did you take the route that I want to take, all these things, and the, and the passenger experience, and the ride experience, was it too hot, too cold, was it just right porridge, you know, all that sort of stuff, People are very sensitive to things, and that's why there's so much work going behind this on automation, and why it's not there where you want it to be, because the technology has to go through its series of learnings to get there. Here is the AV space. So the top blue box, top left box, are the AV companies working on moving people. The top orange box are the AV companies working on moving things, local deliveries. The top right box are the companies that are moving on logistics, on long haul. And then the red box is all the software supplying companies to make sure the whole thing works as an ecosystem. I can't keep up with this. I actually am running out of boxes because it's filling up every couple of weeks. So there is a lot of, a lot of interest and money in this because there's so much potential to get from this opportunity. And it's not just uh, passenger vehicles and freight. Everything that has an engine and a motor in it, whether it's ground, sea, or air, will eventually be automated because the opportunity is just too good to resist. And so to make automation work, you need four pieces. You need what's called artificial intelligence, which is just a code word for a really fast computer. You, know, you need really fast computing power. Machine learning is what you did when you were a child, when your mum and dad showed you up the side of an apple and an alphabet. You, know, you learned this at Apple, A, B, C. That's what it does. It needs to learn all of that sort of stuff. And it needs a sensor suite, and it needs a map. It needs to know where it is, otherwise it's not going to work. And how it works in the, on a vehicle, uh, you have LiDAR, which is the laser, uh, laser radar there. You have supplemental sensors. You have, a, you have a radar system. You have microphones. You have all these different things. Basically, it has to be manually and digitally integrated to do what you do and take for granted. You know, you ask yourself, you know, where am I? What's around me? What's everybody doing? What should I do next? You ask yourself this all the time before you get into a vehicle. We have to program all of that into a vehicle so we can actually know, know what it's doing. And then this is basically what it looks like. This is where the uh, tel intelligence really sets in. The vehicle is basically here. It needs to figure out where it's going to go next, but it needs to understand the world around it, what's everybody doing, 
And that's where that trajectory of artificial intelligence and compute comes in to figure out, well, what is everybody going to do next? Because it can't see everybody. It sees pixels. It needs to understand, well, what are these movements going to do based on all this uh, algorithmic analysis? And it needs to understand different user types. This is a person on a bicycle. It needs to know that a person on a bicycle travels at this speed. This is the typical movement of a person on a bicycle. They will, may signal right or left, but it follows the steering wheel of the bike. If the bike is moving this way, it's more likely going to move that way as well. And then it figures out the safe path of travel. So this is basically, in a nutshell, how this all works. And uh, all the AV companies that are working on this in this way are basically looking at the same thing. So now you're all experts, you can explain to your friends, um, and now we can move forward. And so when we talk about AV technology, it can get very distracting because the media likes to just muddle things up because they love stories. Um, why an ex exception to why, right, obviously. <laughs> so there is really two things you need to know about this technology. If it requires you to, to operate the vehicle with brakes, pedals, or steering wheel, it's not an AV company technology. Simple as that. If you can walk into the vehicle and do this, which you probably already do with your car, which you shouldn't be doing, but this, you already do this, you're in an AV vehicle. And the reason being is that if you have to take control of the vehicle in any form or way, then it's just, it's an advanced driver assistance vehicle, which is great to have and important for safety, but it's not an autonomous vehicle. And the key fundamental difference is that an AV vehicle shifts you from being a driver to being a rider. You are no longer in control of the vehicle. You're in control of the ride, but you're not in control of the vehicle. And the vehicle, when you become a rider, now the whole world opens up. Those 10 days that I talked about you wasting your time in the, in the vehicle, that's what's interesting to people, because look what we do with those 10 days. You go from being a driver focused on a dashboard. That's why we use the word dashboard in meetings. It's the most pertinent information for your manager. But when you shift from being a, uh, a driver to a dashboard, all of a sudden now you have a rider experience. You can watch TV, Netflix, go shopping, go to sleep, uh, have conference calls, play video games, do things that we don't need to talk about. You can do all of those things, right? So this is a very different experience than uh, when you're a driver. So now this 10 days becomes incredibly monetizable and an interesting opportunity. And the form factor will change as well. It will not be passenger-looking cars. They're going to change over time, but we're going to go from all these different forms, overnight movement to intercity travel, all of these different opportunities will come up um, over time. And it won't just disrupt transportation. This thing will disrupt everything around it. It's not, so the first thing that we'll see is transportation services, whether it's gas stations, professional drivers, maintenance vehicles, sales dealerships, driving schools, all this sort of stuff, they'll all be disrupted. But then the support services, whether it's the data centers, the different services, the home care, elderly care, all the different care services, the legal system, our military, all of these things will be disrupted. And then finally, all of our land systems will be completely disrupted, whether it's hotels, real estate, development, construction, parking garages, fast food retail outlets, hotels, gyms, etc. This is all going to be slowly and surely uh, uh, upended. So this is not just about an AV technology for a vehicle. It's about the whole way of changing our economy. And what that means is that we're going to have significant impacts to the way cities function, what, how they manage their land, how they design their streets, the revenues they expect to get from parking, and all the different performance measures are all being put on their head right now. And so we're going to have this big uh, existential shift in terms of how we manage our transport system from a governance perspective because there's just this is not going to be the status quo anymore. And what that means is that we need to now start thinking about government as a governance platform. So we talked about platforms before, the interaction between producers and consumers. Now the government has to start shifting to be a platform between its citizenry and the people that provide the services and interact between those two. And so they're going to need to, have to get their hands around all the digital issues, whether it's privacy, whether it's uh, data capture, whether it's, whether it's the algorithms themselves that accidentally or, in, or purposely discriminate against people. All of that stuff needs to be worked out in, in one area. The mobility providers will need to be coordinated, you know, to make sure they actually work together, they interact with each other, they're not one or the other. This concept called wall gardens where you can only use the services inside one company, that's a governance issue that, that needs to be addressed. And then the infrastructure, what kind of street allocation do we want uh, to see this move forward? Because AV technology is not a tool, it's an enabler. 
So if your system is not able to deal with things, it's going to press those buttons again and again and again and remind you, you haven't dealt with your policy issues and you've got a lot of policy homework to do. I've had so many people come to me and saying, I can't wait for AV Tech. I won't have to do anything anymore in my city. It's going to be taken care of. And I'm like, uh oh, you have to do a lot of work to get to the point where AV Tech is going to help your city. And so we have some fundamental issues that we need to address. You know, safety must be paramount. We also need to look at equity, interoperability, affordability and sustainability. We can't afford to let these key areas just be pushed aside because we're so distracted by this shiny new toy. We need to really understand what is this thing for, what problem is it solving, and how do we actually solve this problem. And so here is a situation in San Francisco where we really need to start thinking about our city a little bit differently, and we need to stop these um, infight or these cat fighting that's happening between systems because we need to see what the, what the data is actually telling us. This is the number of, this is the percentage of trips by mode to, from, and within San Francisco. So all the shared mobility, you know, the scooters, the bike share, the car share, all those stuff, all that stuff that's getting a lot of like antagonistic catfighting about the use of the sidewalk and the street and the ride hailing, it's 6% of our total daily trips. How many people are surprised by the fact that it's a 6% number and not 60%? Exactly. So let's, let, 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 that, let that sink in for a second. A quarter of all our trips are by walking. We are the best machines, right? A quarter of our trips are all working, and 26% of our trips are by public transport. A couple of thousand vehicles are moving a quarter of all of our trips, and the other 43% need 400,000 vehicles. Let's, let's look at the reality of how we use our resources. So we have 43% of all trips by car, and yet when it comes to our space of use of land, it's a very different story. How machine learning and everybody else looks at things and so from, from a computer perspective, it's like, okay, let's allocate space for each human being. We all take up about one square yard, depending on, on how much breakfast we've had, right? So it's about one square yard per person. On a bicycle, we need about two square yards, a little less than two square yards. But when you're in a car, you need eight of these squares. So each square is a person. You take up eight times the space for your one self in your car. How is that actually fair in a system that's supposed to be a public resource? It's not but we've allowed ourselves to do it because we've become numb to it because we see this over and over again. When we look at the vehicle itself, the front two squares are used for an engine that may explode so we contain it all and we, we, we galvanize it so we take up all that space. And the back two squares are for all our stuff and our junk that we never even look at. We, half the people don't even know what's actually in the back of their, their trunk. So these two squares are basically going to be eliminated with electrification um, and automation because we won't need to store things here and we won't need to have all that space up front for, for an engine. So when we eliminate those opportunities, now we can start putting in eight people in this same space footprint that we had in a passenger vehicle. And if we don't want this, we can actually have a smaller passenger size vehicle for just two of us or just one of us. But we don't need to take up all those eight, eight tiles. We can just use one tile. So just to think about in terms of how we use our space and how form factor will change over time. And in places, even in San Francisco and other cities, all of that shared mobility that I was talking about, that was the majority of trips, frankly, the car was actually 43%, it's the majority of trips, they take up this much space on the street, and we give all of that, the rest of it for cars. There is a disproportionate use of space based on what it's needed for. And for some of you, you may be thinking, thinking, well, I need my car, I need to get around, I'm not going to do this, but if we look at everybody as an equal person, and everybody has access to the right-of-way, this is completely inequitable and completely distorted. And if you think AVs are dystopic, what is this? Isn't this dystopia? I mean, we need to have a bit of a reality check on this sort of stuff. And so when we look at our streets, this is where cities will have the best opportunity to design for the shared electric automated opportunity because when this is designed just like this as it is today, this, says to a sig this signals to an automated vehicle company, you can go anywhere you want. You can do whatever you want. It's no big deal. Remember, the technology has no moral compass. It has no philosophy. It has no thoughts. It has no ideas. It does what it's programmed to do, and it'll do it exceptionally well. Its job is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. If that's what you give it, it's going to take up every square inch of space possible. But if you're smart and you say, actually, this is what we want to allocate for based on that ratio that we had, we have uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and um, micromobility in the green piece, we have high-capacity transportation, which could be automated. It doesn't need to just be public transit. It can be automated high-capacity. And the rest of the corridor, based on how it is, can be for personal or deliveries or anything else. This sends a very clear signal to the AV technology. Oh, this is where I'm supposed to go. 
And if I can get more passengers, I can go in this lane. So in the peak periods, if it's busy, I will find those seven passengers and I'll get in this lane as well. But without those guidelines, what we call guardrails, it's not going to know what to do and it's going to get blamed again, just like everybody else gets blamed, and the technology will get blamed again and again and again because we're not willing to do the hard work ourselves and actually fix our streets. And that's where the policy issue comes in terms of us as, as people. And in San Francisco, we already have this, you know. We already have Market Street where, you know, my team was part of this, where we, we fought that fight to, to, to dedicate those space in the street, and the street works really well. You know, it actually works relative, it actually works very well. When this becomes an automated street, we're just going to have automated vehicles, either large or small, in those spaces where they're allowed, but not much will change. And I think that's where the, the real uh, question is on what's the role of policy in this, and rather than having that victim re you know, retaliation approach, how about being much more permissive and figuring out how to actually work together and partner together? And so whether AV vehicles will be a first or last mile option, uh, connecting to rail or public transit, like, a, like in the Bay Corridor with Caltrain, or whether it'll be its own um, AV shuttle service connecting people from community to neighborhood, all of these things are gonna be experimented and explored because there's so much opportunity to look at all of these in, in different ways. And <coughs> There's really three ways to, to change behavior in this, in this world, really. There are incentives, there is pricing, which for some reason the US is like being in a house that's on fire and you can't talk about water for some reason. We can't talk about pricing our transport system. Um, and then there's restrictions, banning. We've actually done a little bit of this, but 30 cities around the world are banning cars right now in their central cities. So this is, these are opportunities to really think this through. Remember that three billion people are coming into cities, there's gotta be a way to move more people rather than in their eight square yard uh, vehicles. We need to think a different way. And then just as you thought that was difficult enough, now we have to figure out how we're gonna pay for all of this. Because if we have shared electric and automated, our fossil fuel based parking revenue taxation policy runs out of money. If these vehicles don't need to be parked, there's no more parking revenue. If these vehicles aren't crashing into each other, there's no more uh, insurance revenue. If these vehicles don't run on, on gasoline or diesel, there's no more fossil fuel tax revenue. How do we pay for our infrastructure? So we need to think about now about shifting our model completely to a pickup and drop off fee and a time of use fee. So think of this as a, as a person waiting for a thing or a parcel, whether it's in the ground or in the sky, and these pickup and drop offs, which we refer to as PUDOs, will need to be charged a per second per use, per type fee based on the vehicle type. And that's how the cities will be able to uh, ensure that they have the adequate uh, resource they need to move forward. In the sky is a very different role because the whole world's been mapped as, as a grid. And so we know each square in the sky and these drones are gonna have to map their routes. Certain routes won't be allowed to be used, so they'll have to avoid those routes. And so all of this stuff is being worked on as we speak. And in very short time, we're gonna have the ability to actually start playing and testing this out. So just to close in, we can't do this by ourselves. The government can't do it by themselves. The technology companies can't do it by themselves. And, and we know that uh, the research institutions can't do it themselves. But we have to do it together. And as Pete mentioned with City Innovate, that's what we've been trying to do is to bring in government companies and educators together to figure this out because there are some real fundamental shifts happening here that we need to figure out how to actually get it done and get it done properly. And so we need to now really 2.0 everything that we do in our, in our transportation world and just in our society in general, but we need to have less fear and open up more. We need to start saying yes before we, actually, we just say no. We need to start making stuff and making stuff more often, and we need to bet small and then go big because we're not gonna make it in time. We've got, you know, I, I, was gonna, I wasn't gonna say this, but this is not a time to worry about boiling the ocean. The fossil fuel companies are doing that for us, right? So we need to, we need to actually get our hands, the, the clock's ticking. We need to, we need to get this going, uh, whether you believe in this stuff or not. The issues are around us are really important to move. So I want us to get to a point where our streets look more like this, where we have the adequate, appropriate amount of space for motorized vehicles that are needed, but the rest of the street space is what it was before we had cars, which was an incredibly lively, public, open space. And I really hope we get there. So I really appreciate it for your time. Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is my autonomous vehicle, just so <laughs> you know. So, get back awesome. to Awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Um,
hope that wasn't an overload of info yeah. to kind of get, to get us going here in our I promised you that, right? You yeah, said no, he that was, you it, wanted that. I it was it. awesome. Um, I'm going to start this off with just getting a couple questions going. But again, start talk, thinking, folks, in your own kind of mind, uh, particularly people in this industry, kind of ways to talk about, uh, riff off this in a way. Um, chicken and egg thing. I mm. mean, y you kind of talk about there's all the pieces have to go. But um, how how do we start this thing? I mean, do you, do you think it's a government thing? Like, let's set some standards. Let's set some goals. Do you think it's um, it just how do you move it? Or is it all kind of you just got to do the dance together somehow? Yeah, you got to do a little bit of that. You got to do the dance together somehow. But, you know, it's, it's already moving. It's already started. Yep. Nothing I've said here is Tim's personal opinion. This is yep. just what's going on around the world. And, and uh, you know, nothing confuses people more than the data and the facts, right? So especially in this age. So we... We've got to get our hands around what's our roles, number one. Right. You know, we need to do a big racy for the whole world, like a responsibilities, accountability, you know, consulted and informed. What's my role? If I'm government, what is my role? As a tech company, what's my role? As an educator, what's my role? Because we need the three to work together. And then community, what's your role as a community? I think this idea that you can show up at 2 in the afternoon every Tuesday at City Hall and scream and shout, you know, blue murder all the time about any project, that's, that's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to start thinking about what's our role? You know, what is our role to actually do this? How do we do this? Each, pi e each piece of the uh, puzzle. Each piece of the puzzle, yeah. And exactly. um, you and I, when we were talking here, you were talking the next 10 years yes. are, are critical. Now, on the other hand, a lot of what you laid out here, particularly the long-term vision, I mean, that's like right. a 50-year kind of but transition yeah. too. So, so what, what do you expect is going to happen or should happen in the next 10 years? How far can we get and how fast? Right. So on the, on the technology side, you know, I think we give it a little bit too much attention of, of concern and fear. The technology is going to figure itself out. It has to pass through some pretty hefty milestones before it can become commercially deployed at the scale that we expect it to be. So over the next 10 years, we're going to see the technology, uh, both for electrification and for automation, just grow and mature. You know, electrification is, is a mechanical issue. We need to just put them in vehicles, sell them, and get them out there, right? We just need to get that going. Battery technology aside and the range issue aside, most trips are not 500 miles long. So, you know, the, the electric vehicle companies of, to, of, of the next year or two will be able to meet 90% of people's needs very quickly. So there's that piece, but perception's real. That's a, it's a cultural perception issue is real. On the um, sharing side, it's difficult to share you know, to share services and share rights. People in general, if they've been brought up after kindergarten, don't want to share anymore because I don't have to. I'd rather pay my way to have individuality. So it's a real big deal. It's, but how do we harness the fact that everybody's an individual, everybody does their own thing, and our individual actions result in collective chaos? And so we need to figure out there has to be some sort of gatekeeper approach of saying, I like individuality, but at this point in time, at this particular location, you have to pay more for your individualism because you, this is not, we can't move. We have to move around. So how do we do that? And I think those are the conversations that over the next three to five years need to be uh, thoughtfully done. There's ideas about congestion pricing. There's ideas about restricting access. There's all these different ideas, but unless we test and try them, we won't know if they actually even work. A lot of these are theories. The whole network effect is still a theory. Like we need to, we need to test out these theories. So, my my uh, my guess is that the next three years we're going to be testing a lot of these different assumptions, assertions, and and um, ideas, and then they'll start really starting to sort themselves on whether or not they have teeth or not in it. And in the in the background, the tech companies will be maturing their technology um, and starting to deploy in more and more cities and figuring out what this actually looks like. Well, we're here in what's now San Francisco. T to what extent do you think San Francisco is ahead of the curve, leading, or, or other places you'd look to to kind of really, from the public policy side, not, yeah. not, not it's set aside the tech thing, which is a different right. animal? You know, San Francisco is a challenge because there's so many uh, moving parts in the city. You know, it's... it's I mean, and I mean the region. When I the region, yeah. yeah. But you look at San Francisco, it's my thumb, my thumbnail, and, and yeah. the Bay Area is like yeah, that. So yeah. it's kind of like surrounded, you know, by all, all these yeah, people. Yeah. That's how some San Francisco feels like. We're surrounded by the region, right? Yeah, so um, there's, there's all these different pieces. And just outside the San Francisco... So if, if you think of San Francisco as broken up into four quadrants, the Northeast Quadrant and the Southeast Quadrant, the rest of the Bay Area doesn't look like that at all. You know, there's very few pockets that look like that. So it's a very different uh, space. And so, yes, San Francisco is well ahead in its land use policy, 
in some of its transportation policies, but in its day-to-day -day management of these transportation systems, when the data is just compelling them to take action, for some reason we're not taking action. And that's just political, or it's apathy, or it's whatever it is. And it's not just transportation, there are a whole other buckets in our, in our city that we're not dealing with accordingly for some reason. And those reasons are because, you know, we have citizenry that are very engaged, very opinionated, and when I went to the city, we used to say that we have 800,000 transportation experts in the city, <laughs> and they're no better than you do, right? But no one's willing to compromise, and, and we love innovation as long as it doesn't mean we have to change anything in our life. And so we can't have that anymore. We need to start thinking about, well, what, do we, what does that look like? There are other parts in the, in, in the U.S. that are, I would say, they're not the big flash star cities, they're much more the, the second, second and third tier cities they're much more engaged in this conversation because mm. for them it's existential. Are we going to be around? Are we attractive? Is this something that we want to get our hands around? And a lot of them are in the middle of the country, they're in the, the southeast of the country, they're in the northwest, like they're really trying to think these things through. And then you go outside of the US and every capital that I've, that I've spoken to is really trying to get their hands around this, like, you know, what does this mean? What's funny is that the regions that really want this technology are probably not the regions where the technology wants to go to, and the regions that are not sure they want this technology is absolutely where the tech companies want to go to. So we're going to have to have negotiate, negotiated partnership discussions. Be, be a little more specific with that, meaning you, uh, the tech companies don't want to go to these global, you know, Jakarta, you know, yeah, Nairobi, so just kind of big... So mega cities and uh, and the means. Say more about what you're trying. So to basically, say. if you're a if you're a mega city that's super complex and complicated, and there's a whole bunch of things going on in your streets and it's total chaos, this is not the technology for you right now. It will be eventually, but not right now. You have some basic Maslow hierarchy of order of transportation needs to take care of. You need to pave your streets. You need to create uh, a, some sort of order on your traffic system. You need to create safe pedestrian spaces. You need to create safe spaces for cycling. Like all these things haven't been done yet. Just throwing AV technology on that will just make things more yep. or less the same. Countries like the Netherlands that have really focused on pedestrian safety, bicycling as a main form of transport, public transport, dedicated lanes for this and that. When you put AV technology on that, it's just going to improve what's already there. So we're in the middle where we've got some chaos, some order, mostly fragmented networks. So our job in the next couple of years is to stitch all those fragmented networks together so that this AV technology, when it's ready, can actually do what it's supposed to do. Otherwise, it's just going to make things more or less the same. And well, that would be a huge waste of energy for that. You know, we had Kai-Fu Lee here, kind of the AI expert um, in the fall, uh, talking about just how the really the next rev of AI is really going to, he was arguing, dominated by, by the Chinese companies. Yeah. To what extent is the autonomous, well, you, you haven't really <coughs> mentioned China. How do they fit in this overarching uh, yeah. situation? I only had here? 30 minutes, so I could Yeah, no, 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 I know that. No, that's why hours, I'm picking right? up things yeah, yeah. that you, you weren't able to get to. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, you know, in that square of all those companies, a lot of them are Chinese companies, yep. um, a lot of them are, are American companies, and some are European, uh, some are, some are uh, from other parts of, of Asia. That's really who's in this, in this race. So in China, you have what's called the Great Firewall. Nothing can go in, nothing can go out, except for permission. But they're working very diligently on this. I mean, I've met with the Beijing government a few times. They're looking at this as one system for their, for their economy, and they're, they're really moving forward on it. Europe is looking at it in a very different way, and the US is looking at it you know, in between. So it's kind of this, we're going to see it happen in, in different forms. It's not going to be even across the world. It's going to be very uneven. It most likely will happen in North America first, just because of it's from here and people are more or less going to want to see it, it play out here. Uh, there's an issue with vehicles. So when you have a vehicle, uh, for a vehicle to be certified to be used in a country, it has to go through this thing called homologation. And its homologation is bound by its market. And if it's in one country with 50 states and 300 cities, there's a lot of play opportunity. But if you have to go to a different country all the time, your ability to scale is going to be somewhat challenged. So you're going you're gonna to focus on the areas where you can actually have room to grow. And that, that's why you'll see it probably in North America and China most likely first. And I'm going to turn it over to you folks. So be thinking what you want to roll in here shortly. But, um, uh, you know, one of the, the things about this network here is they come from different uh, yeah. fields. Yeah. And so it's not all auto or it's not all this space. Right. What was interesting to me is you were talking about all the different worlds that could get transformed, real estate, other kind of things. Right. Um, you know, just maybe just give a kind of a, could you talk a little bit about that repercussion? So, for example, if you do liberate 
parking spaces and car spaces in a city. That's like a third of the city, right? Gets yeah. kind of liberated for five, for new kinds of businesses. Five, five billion square feet in the U.S. alone. Five S billion is or is dedicated to car to parking across uh, across the across, across the country. And if you look at that, if, even if it was uh, two hundred dollars a square foot, we're talking a couple of trillion dollars. Like this is not small numbers. The real estate industry may actually be the beneficiary of this whole technology in the long run because they're going to see they're going to be able to see transformative change in those spots. The average shopping center is fifty-five percent uh, parking spaces and forty-five percent actual retail space. So now you can go to 100% or completely change because retail is being completely turned upside down. So maybe they start doing other things in those spaces. So the suburban parking spots environment is going to be completely upended by this. Keep an eye on that, folks. Uh, final thing here before we roll <laughs> into the... that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. Are you optimistic? I mean, so, so one of the things I'm, we're always... Am I optimistic? Yeah. Yeah. How optimistic are you in this next 10 years? We're going to actually rise to the occasion and really come up with a kind of comprehensive mm. system that would really make this stuff bomber and really work. And for that matter, lead the world in, in other... From an American perspective, you know, that the, our cities can be transformed in that time. Yeah. Well, and, and it, uh, just, yeah. Are you optimistic and, and, or not and why? So I'm always cautiously optimistic. Okay. Um, I can see the signs and the trends that we can do something, but I've seen in the past where it's, we're here, we're here, we're here, and now we're moving that way. So um, it's very hard to, to change the course of direction. I'm really optimistic about cities. I think cities is where all the innovation in our world is, frankly. Um, I'm not optimistic about our, our other levels of government, unfortunately. I want to see them. I'm actually optimistic about California. We, you know, our whole new approach to government and having a whole dedicated team for innovation, I think that's going to be very exciting to see. There's so, much, so many onions to peel in this process of policy. I call it policy surgery and policy acupuncture. We need to go to a, so many different pieces of policy and really systematically take some things out that are blocking uh, progress in this area. So it's going to be a hard slog. This is not just a shake your flag on the street type thing and wish it for it to happen. We have to roll up our sleeves and go through step by step by step. A lot of the assumptions we've had about why transportation is what it is, what's the cost of transportation, what is the cost of moving a person from A to B, a thing from A to B, what should we pay someone to do that, all those things need to be re-examined and rethought. And a lot of people are not going to be comfortable doing that because it means that they're going to have to slightly change the way that they do their, their way of life. And if climate action is any indicator of what we're doing, we have a big uphill battle uh, in front of us. But I'm optimistic in the sense in that cities are actually at the forefront of this, and AI technology will press the button on every single policy that's not being addressed and remind people again and again and again until they take action, that you need to take action. Awesome. All right, let's roll to the crew here. Um, now, just to remind everyone, uh, this is live stream, so uh, when we call on you, uh, someone's going to run you a mic, stand up, just identify yourself so we kind of situate you and what you do or where you're coming from, and then uh, ask a question or, or say something here. Let's, let's start here with this guy right here. Hi, and thank you for that talk. It was very interesting. Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a consultant at Slalom, and I work, my client right now is AAA at their okay. innovation lab where they're reinventing themselves uh, in this changing mobility space. Yeah. But the question I wanted to ask, I mean, you talked a lot and gave really interesting insights on government and technology and policy, um, but people are a big element of this too. I live in Oakland near Lake Merritt. We made national news because we were throwing those scooters into the lake. Yeah. Um, so how do we shift people's Don't do that, by the way. That's vandalism. From being yeah. uh, scared of and creating this backlash and unintended consequences there to getting them excited and clamoring for these technologies? And where are those stories that we can use to change people's approach? Well, you just said that magic word story. So I have a, I have a slide in another deck that, if I have more time, would um, go into. The three things that we're missing right now that we really need to get our hands around is data science, really understanding how to use data and visualize data. We need to have urban psychologists. We don't have them in most uh, public spaces. Corporations do, but public uh, agencies don't do. Of what are people saying? What are they thinking? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? What upsets them? What, what excites them? What brings them fear? What brings them delight? And the storytelling piece. We need storytellers. We can't have these public meetings where you just throw a chart you know, and say, isn't this great? Uh, by the way, it's the 11th hour of the project. We just wanted to tick it off because we have to tick off that we did a, a public consultation meeting, and now we're going to go and build the infrastructure. That's not going to work anymore. We need to engage the people from the very beginning and say, what do you want? What do you need? 
what is working for you right now? What's not working? And what will it take for us to get what you need in your community to make it different? And sometimes it actually might not be transportation. It may be they need jobs. Maybe they need access to fresh food or resources. Maybe they need childcare. It's, it's all of these different things that we assume that it's all about the bus driver transit project or the bike lane or the bus lane, and sometimes it's about something else. But if we don't have those conversations up front to really get the pulse of the community, they can't get excited because they, they see it as an affront. And where tech companies have failed is, you know, it's that ambush overnight. It's like, here we are, isn't this amazing? It's the best thing since sliced bread. And people are like, what is this? And then they pick it up and they throw it in the lake, right? So had they, had they spoken a couple of months before saying, hey, we're trying to explore a new microelectric de uh, uh, device that's affordable, it's equitable, you don't need to know how to use it, you can just hop on and use it. We're going to offer it in different parts of the neighborhood to connect it to BART to get you to your first last mile. That's a very different conversation than, look at this cool bro tech toy, man. Don't you love it? It's awesome, right? <laughs> no, I don't, because it didn't meet my needs because I was never asked what I wanted, right? So there's a whole different way. Of, and it's not just the scooter companies. It's everybody in this space that never speaks with the community in advance about what do they actually need. It shouldn't be a solution looking for a problem. It should be a problem looking for a solution, right? Yeah. Awesome. So let's... let's um, what do we, we ha let's see, see Hans just comes, just trying to understand, uh, okay, so, so, oh wait, you're not going to grab that? He covered, it. he covered it more? Okay, how about right here, let's get to the guy right here, and then we'll come over here. Yeah, hi, I'm Waman from Harman. Uh, hey. Uh, you talked about the, uh, what people will do in the autonomous drive, they'll watch Netflix and all of that. So who do you think will dominate that space? I didn't catch the first part of the question, yeah, sorry. Get a look, uh, put it a lot closer. So in the autonomous you. drive, you said people will look, watch Netflix, they'll do shopping and all of that. Who do you think will dominate that space? Are the space inside the vehicle? Yeah. It's too early, I don't know. I mean, you, you choose. Who knows? I don't have an answer. Yeah. It's so early right now, we're going to see a lot of different experimentation, um, and we'll see different company. I mean, a lot of the car companies will have their existing partnerships, and they'll, they'll infuse that into the, the space. Others will use a different platform approach. It's to be determined. But there's a lot of experimentation going on right now on the existing system, let alone the AV system. You know, just to riff on that one thing, um, yeah. Sunil Paul did an autonomous vehicle version. Who Sunil is uh, one of the co-founders of Sidecar. Right. Um, I know him very well. Yeah, no, I was just going to give it to everyone <laughs> here. But um, he was saying, gosh, when you can start sleeping, is that going to lead to this kind of urban creep where, you know, people are coming in for two hours from the Sierras or something and actually adding to the problem. So, I mean, anyhow, so there's it's happening today. We, the number of super commuters have actually increased tremendously across the Bay Area because we're not building enough housing because all of us say no to high density housing yeah. and then we complain that there's traffic on our streets. You can't have it both, people. You, you know, the best way to deal with congestion other than the work culture thing is to allow people to live closer to where they work. And these people uh, are commuting from, you know, all the way down to Merced now. They're coming up a few days a week to work. You know, two-hour commutes each way. It's maddening, right? Yeah. We shouldn't have to do that. So AVs will just make it yeah, the same. I it's it's already different. happening. So there's nothing that AVs will do differently unless we don't want it to change. Go ahead here. Hi. Oh, sorry. Could, could you stand Stacey. up just, just, uh, sure. just to help um, us? Stacey Randecker. I'm with the Flying Car Show. And... Um, I am a San Francisco res resident, and um, the two things that you said that I just, we cannot continue to have 27 transit agencies <laughs> and expect anything to get done, and also we cannot do everything by committee. So when you think about those things, about how we have this structured or how it's come to be over time, you know, through government and funding and whatever, and the whole notion of everyone gets a freaking say and we can't decide and move forward, how would you change this? Yeah. What would you do to you know, remove these barriers and actually move us forward? Yeah, so I think that's a really, really hard uh, challenge that we have, not just in the Bay Area, but in many places like this. You know, legislation got us to this point and legislation is what's gonna be required to get us out of this, this mess that we have. And we need to have elected officials who are willing and able to put themselves on the line and actually get these things moving forward. We have to care enough about that these issues are actually worth fighting for. Um, and it's, it's a real challenge to see that there are certain things that we're willing to fight for and other things we're not willing to fight for as, as a region. Um, I've been um, surprised how at these public meetings or at these uh, 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 forums, 
that the same people are coming over and over again, and there's 8 million people in the Bay Area that never show up to these things or don't communicate. So clearly the solid majority is saying, we're okay with it, it's fine. Or the solid majority is saying, I don't even know this even exists. And if I'd known, I'd radically be there saying yes, right? So we need to get the word out some more. I think we need to think about different ways of communication, different ways of engagement, because the old ways are not working, they haven't worked for a long time, and the new ways are, are being, are being uh, kind of questioned. If you have 15 people coming up to a public meeting saying, we don't want this bike lane project, but 9,000 people have submitted an online form saying, I want it, but I can't come because I'm working, who gives more value to what? It's usually the people that are in the front, right? So we need to think about what are the different ways of, of, of engagement that give everybody equal footing, but actually get us to move the needle. The other thing is that I've noticed in other parts of the world that do this, they engage the community and say, it's, we're not going to decide whether or not we're going to do a bike lane. We're going to decide where we put the bike lane. It's this street, this street, or this street. That's the engagement, not should we or should we not put in the bike lane. And we need to start doing more of that. Of we're the experts, we have figured this out based on all the data, the urban psychology, and the storytelling. Now we want to ask you, what color do you want your wall? Not whether or not you get a wall in your room, right? That's, I mean, it's like teenagers, you know, you can't, you can't blow out the wall, kids, but you can figure out if you actually want to have um, different colors in your bedroom. So that's the sort of thing that needs to change, and I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that, but it's always challenged. The, we're starting to see it slowly, you know, in certain things, but it's, the challenge we have here is that, you know, we decide to a certain point, and then somebody new comes in and says, wait about this, and then we, we go that way. So keeping true to form is also very difficult. It's a, it's a discipline. And we just need, we need people to, to be, be clear about that. Oh, okay. oh, Gerald, we can get Gerald here? Yeah. Okay, okay. See hands over here. I'm just trying to gauge what's going on here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, Gerald Harris. I'm in the energy and the scenario business. Uh, let me just say what you just said shocked me to death <laughs> in light of the negative externalities from technologies of all sort mm -hmm. that, are, that we're now dealing with. And for you to make the statement you just made is frightening because you're putting a value on efficiency and productivity over everything else, just like most engineers do. And what you just said, it's not democratic or inclusive. But here's my question, though. Mm -hmm. The electricity that's behind this, people are assuming it's always going to be here. Right. Right now, <clears throat> in San Francisco, the public utility company just filed for bankruptcy yep. a month ago. Okay, so the notion that there's going to be this low-cost electricity everywhere and available as we had as, as we have it now is an incorrect assumption, because the other part of that climate change issue is coal and everything else that we've been using, and for for, for some reason, people want cheap electricity. Mm -hmm. Like cheap it's no transport. longer going to be available because right. it has the same peaking problem that you mentioned there. So I'm just going to suggest one that you move back to democracy and that you look at what the electric power issues are because they are huge and difficult to solve. Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, there's, whoop, oh, yeah, okay, right here, we'll go to this one. Oh, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I was going to say, more of a statement, I don't think okay. I said anything about democracy uh, in this. I said that in order to us to move the needle forward, we're going to have to make some hard decisions on certain things. Um, and I think that's going to be the case that we have. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to just see more of the worst of what we have. We the it sounds like we the people. In the middle of my diagram, the middle of that diagram was people. You have to decide this. I wasn't challenging that. And I think in just before I'd mentioned that if we don't address those values in th up front, we're not going to get to those solutions that we want, right? So... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Could you get here? Yes. Hello, Sundrin from Luxembourg Trade and Investment Hi. Office. So, um, I one observation and one question. The observation is that actually our government decided that from uh, 2020 onwards, public transportation will be for free yeah. all over the country. So this is a new perspective and it's part of a puzzle right. of, a, of a strategy to make people again using more other means of transport, especially public transports but uh, the demand has to be also 
increased and the also offering a more efficient way of public transportation. Right. So it would be interesting to have your opinion on that one. And the second point is that in uh, your diagrams, especially when you had like the bike lanes that are increasing, I did not see anything ab about flying taxis. Was that on purpose mm. not included here or do you see this too far fetched in a 10 year strategy? Or how would you be your view on that one? Yeah, Thanks. so it was in one of the diagrams. It was in the top right hand corner, but I was moving quickly, so you probably didn't catch it. It's okay. Um, so on public transport, you know, it comes down to geometry in a city. If a city is dense, the geometry will dictate that you want to move more people close together as much as you can. Whether that, that'll be public transport as we know it, that's what we need to keep doing and keep doing because that's the most efficient way to move people in and out of, a, of an area. Whether it's automated or not is really not, is a, it's a, that's, a tech, that's a background technology thing. The, the vehicle itself needs to carry as many people as it can and automation can provide some efficiencies in there and maybe it can work to stretch the dollar that you have to provide the service. Um, many people think that automating public transit will result in all the drivers basically being fired. But we know there's enough people who use public transport that need assistance to get on the vehicle. So we'll always need some ambassador of some sort to be there. And the reason why the person on who uh, drives the bus is called an operator is because they do much more than just drive the bus. They operate the whole vehicle. And if they would have a chance to not be stuck like this all day long and actually interact, there are, there are different ways to do that. So automation can help in that way um, and augment what you already have. Um, whether it's free or not, that's a decision based on the public. You know, most public transport in the US is 75 to 80% subsidized already. So what's another 20%? Oh well. Um, but, you know, people tend to look after things that they they pay for than things that are for free in the public space, unless your culture is uh, kind and, and community oriented. Uh, so um, ours may not be that way. Um, so you know, we, it's, a, it's a, just a different way of looking at that, but it's definitely a tool. Um, it comes down to people use public transit when it's frequent, reliable, and quick, right? If it's not frequent, reliable, and quick, they're not gonna use it. And we have to redefine public transport in the US because a bus coming every 20 minutes on a corridor is not public transit. In Europe and in Asia, every two or three minutes on a corridor all day long, that's public transit. You know, this 20 minute thing is not public transit. So this is why so few people use it in, in, in most of these uh, regions. And it needs its own dedicated lane. It needs to be able to reliably go backwards and forwards. Otherwise, people of different backgrounds and different incomes cannot interact with the economy. It's only people who can afford a car. And so that's the sort of stuff you have to look at. It's, it's not just technology and uh, money savings. It's equity. You know, it's, it's about getting people equity and access. AVs will just exacerbate all these questions that we haven't actually addressed. That's okay, what they'll do. This woman back, way in the back there in the green. And then you will go back over this way. Uh, I'm Karina. I uh, work in clean energy. I was just curious whether you had any thoughts on um, driver retraining, either from a policy perspective yeah. or from a <coughs> company responsibility perspective for the trips that don't have a service component, like trucking. Yeah, I think the. There's a real corollary, there's a real, uh, anal uh, corollary in, in your industry, in the energy industry. You know, when wind, wind turbine technology started becoming commercialized, there was a lot of questions about what are the people doing in the other, in the other more fossil fuel industries, and there was a job retraining uh, process. We have to do the same thing. There are four and a half million professional drivers in the U.S., and not tomorrow, but in the foreseeable future, we're going to start seeing less and less need for them. In the trucking space, it's kind of interesting because they're already experiencing a pretty severe driver shortage at the same time where the working conditions are pretty, pretty tough. And so AV technology, if done properly, can actually extend the range of these, these, uh, these rounds. And then they're still going to be needed at the endpoints when they go between distribution centers. So it's not clear how many of these jobs will um, eventually uh, go away. But there is, that's why it's a transition period. So over a period of 10 years, that should give us enough time to transition people into a different industry or a different type of work. Who's responsible for that? I think it's a combination of government and uh, the companies that are uh, working on this, whether it's the freight companies or the technology companies or whoever it is, but 
There has to be a combined effort. There already is some funding going on right now on looking at the areas where there is the most uh, specific area of issue with this whole shift. And there's been, um, <coughs> there's a bit, there's been st they've started doing some ideas about what does this retraining look like, what are the industries they go to. Because you just can't shift, the, the worst thing you'll do is you'll retrain people to shift to an industry that's now being disrupted again, right? So we have to look and see how do we keep longevity in, these, in, the, in the workplace, um, and that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. Okay, you, 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 you were, did you have your question still? Yeah. Oh, you're good? Okay, right next to you then. Oh, okay. If, if you, it sounds like you're so I, I mean, I, li I, I live. Could you stand up and just oh, interrupt? Sorry, uh, my uh, name is uh, Farik. I come out of the automotive components industry. I, I grew up in cities with intermodal transport, high density, you know, basically even in before the 50s when there weren't no cars, the U.S. had the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then it was convenience and speed and all of the things you said. Uh, none of which is addressed by the self-driving, as you pointed out multiple times. So it, it goes a little bit back to the 27 and all of that. It's like, what's your, what's your thought how to solve actually the backbone, like the, the Bay Area rapid transit to connect the 8 million people first with the spine before you worry about all the little arteries, right. yeah? or even the high-speed train, all of those type of things. How, and I know it's not quite your topic, but but it's the What's core. Yeah. Well, it's political will. If we don't have the political will, none of these things will happen. You know, we hear all the time that we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough money. If only we had more money, we could do more things. We have a lot of money in this in this region. We have a lot of money in the country as well. We're just choosing not to spend it on the things that actually matter. So it's a political will decision. You know, if we choose to spend it on infrastructure, if we choose to spend it on education, Oops. Much um, if there we choose we to spend on education, on all these different things, we'll see the outcomes that we want. We're not doing that. So either we have to do it ourselves as a local region and self-tax ourselves like we have in the past, or we have to work at the state level, or we have to work at the federal level. But things cost money, and we need to figure out how to pay for stuff. And the reason why uh, in Southeast Asia you can hop between systems and stuff is because they pay for things, right? In Europe, is the same thing. You have to pay for things, and if we don't, we can't expect to get it all for free. It's just not going to work anymore. Are there people in the, uh, this corner? I, I just want, I don't want to neglect the corner. <laughs> so anyhow, is there anyone over there? But okay, that's all fine. Then uh, let's get this one guy in the front, here, front row here. Oh, okay, and yeah. we'll get okay. We'll get to here. Let's see the guy here, and then we'll go here. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Curtis. I'm working on parking technology right now, and you mentioned the five billion square feet of parking space in the U.S., the opportunities for shopping centers. I'm wondering, do you see the application of this technology making a bigger impact on places like San Francisco or Los Angeles that has a lot of open, available space for us? Yeah, so I think it's the, it depends what it is. Like, if you think about it, if this commercializes the point where it's ubiquitous across, across a region, um, we're going to see uh, a big reduction in how people use their cars. They're going to use these services instead, and we, we won't, we'll see a precipitous decline in parking. Already, SFO at the top level of the garages, they're empty, right? That's why they've moved Uber on top of there, because it's, it's available. Um, for the first time in history, I think, SFO is offering free 30-minute parking because it's not being utilized like it was before. So these are not my assertions. This is what's happening across the whole country. And so these are, these are these are factors. Every shopping center that has a multi-level parking structure right now, the top floor is not being used. Anywhere you're looking at these multi-level sp spaces, whether below or above ground, the bottom bottom or the top top is not being fully utilized. So will we need all of these? Absolutely not. Will we get rid of them all? Probably not, because many of these are in strategic locations where the AV technology companies will need fleet management, maintenance, battery swap out, cleaning, storage, etc. So there will be utility for them, not for all of them. In the service parking lot field in the, in the suburbs, it's going to be too valuable to leave it as it is, and it, the push is going to be to turn it over into something else. Um, in real estate, it's all about highest and best use, and location, location, location. If AVs go the way they're going, everywhere will be a desirable location. And so, because your time-distance continuum will be completely distorted, and now wherever you are is where you need to be. So the there there is, is where I am. Right. So, so, so just to explain one more meaning, meaning you can be productive, you can be entertained right. while you're, you're driving. You'll so never be late. Yeah. So, never, so the thing is, this revolutionized our time-space consortium. Like, I was always late to everything. I was always missing my friends. They would always yell at me. I'm running late. I'm almost there. I'm going to be there, right? 
But now if we're in this system of not just AVs but automated connectivity, why are you ever needing to be late to anything? We'll just connect and talk until I physically see you, right? So there's different ways to do this and it'll really shift that notion of I have to live in the city center because it's the most important place to live versus I want to live in a community where I can walk to everything and cycle and feel connected to my community. That could be 100 miles away. You know, I don't need to be physically here. That's a good segue to this. I, I, what I'm assuming <laughs> John might say, because yeah. identify yourself. Uh, hi, my name is John, and um, I just recently, last year, wrote a book, Distributed Teams, free plug. Uh, it's specifically, it's about the management culture piece that you mentioned yeah. at the beginning of your talk. Right. So it's how do you work well together when you're physically apart, and right. in the context of environmental impact, uh, diversity, you talked about uh, people with disabilities not being uh, able to get jobs, that kind of stuff. Right. But also about like urban planning impact and revival of secondary towns. Exactly. Things like that. Exactly. Um, so rather than having more people super commuting, I have all the state, same stats you do in the right. book. Um, rather than have more people super commuting by autonomous cars, why not just walk to a co-working space in your town? Right. So... Um, I'm new in the policy space. Uh, I helped write the Vermont Remote Worker Law okay. last year. I'm working on one for Massachusetts right now. So do you have any uh, guidance for someone who's starting into this space about policy for reviving towns like that? And I don't, yeah. I, I have an opinion, which is it's about getting people to live near where they work by just making it, you can work anywhere because you're changing jobs every two years anyway. Right. Um, but it may be about technology, about having to, fly or drive. I don't know. I'm just right. curious. Yeah, I think that, you know, when I was working um, in city government and we were trying to deal with this issue, you know, we had limited levers that we could actually work with. There's a lot of state laws that prohibit a lot of the things that you would think are common sense. So anything that's, um, anything that is uh, anything but uncommon in, 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 this, in this world. What we found is that people prefer, people would rather work where they live than live where they work. So that's a real difference, right? They would rather live where they they'd rather live where they work than where they live. So if we can make that possible, that allows so many more things for people to actually do. What we also found out is that people are very social. It, they don't want to live if it means that they're living in their suburban uh, development two miles from anything or anybody, eventually they're gonna leave the house and go to a Starbucks or something because they need to be around people. And that's why these cafes are so busy because people are not just really drinking coffee, they just wanna be around people. Watch any time you go there and just, just sit there for five minutes and everyone's just staring at each other's laptop. Just, just wanna connect in some way, even though they don't know each other, right? So that need to be social interaction is really important. So from an urban planning perspective, the local square that we used to have in our towns, that's desperately wanted again. And no matter what you have in AV tech, whether it's flying AVs or driving AVs or driving AV buses, et cetera, people will want to congregate because that's just how we are as people. And the marketplaces, those farmers markets have become so big because people like that interaction. They want to feel, see, and touch. So do you have to do that in a city center or in a, in a, in a hipster-like neighborhood, or can you do it in a far-flung town that, that really could use that talent? It's already happening across the country. Many of the third-tier towns that kind of weren't working uh, in the 80s or 90s, now that I've got good internet connection, a lot of the kids, literally kids who are graduating from these colleges, coming to the Bay Area or to other places for a couple of years saying, you know what, I can do this from home. I can go back to my hometown and do it. And they're starting to show slow revival of these very small towns because they've got the cool bricks and mortar type places and they're 400 bucks a month, not 4,000 a month. So. At the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the economy is stupid. It's really the basic stuff. So it's not a given that the Bay Area will have this magnet for forever. They really need to think this in a different way. Yeah. OK, uh, how about in the way in the back there? Uh, uh, and uh, I, 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 let's, uh, we're getting toward the end here. So I, I, can I just see hands right now? Just, I'm going to try to do the best I can to get to through the folks that we haven't gotten. OK, thank you. Hi, I'm Ray Ng uh, in automotive. Um, and, uh, you know, we hear about all these trends that are happening, and um, my question is really um, working in a legacy, like automotive is a very traditional industry, and everyone's fighting for their piece of the transportation pie. Right. Um, as we go from, for example, this maker of things to a service provider, um, any words of advice for automakers? 
Yeah, I mean, I think some of the automakers that I've, I've actually been meeting with have really taken this seriously. I will say this uh, in jest. Ten years ago, I warned uh, about five OEMs this was going to happen, and I got laughed out of the room every time. It was actually raucous laughter. There's this crazy Australian-American whack job telling us this stuff, right? So I was like, no, look, here are the signs. It's going to be happening. You're going to do it. And now they call me saying, what the F should we do? And I'm like, you've kind of lost 10 years of, of time because you weren't listening to the signals. These signals got louder and louder and louder and louder, and they became sirens, right? So um, now there's little signals about everything else in this world that we need to start paying attention to. So some OEMs have really got their hands around it and are starting to think this through. I think there's two real opportunities. There's the mobility as the service piece. How do you become part of that conversation? And then there's the self-driving technology piece. How do you become either the partner or the, or the, uh, the joint venture or the supplier to that, to that program? And then with those two pieces, what are the things that you're best at? You've got, no, you've got, a, you've got something that nobody else has. You have a vehicle supply chain. No one else has that, right? That is your, your core strength. You work and make stuff really well. You also know what your customers want. That urban psychology piece, you guys know that better than anybody else. Um, and so this is a sort of tools that you can actually leverage, whether you'll be partnering with the ride-hailing company or partnering with a self-driving technology stack company, these are really good leveraging tools because, frankly, you both need each other. And I think the weird thing for OEMs is that they've never had a relationship where they'd have to talk to a peer. It's always been the tier one like this, let me tell you something, son, type of thing, right? And now the tech company is their peer, and they have to figure out how do we work together and do this together. And if they figure that out, there are a few OEMs that are really thinking this through, they're going to be fine. You know, they're going to be creating a more durable vehicle that cannot withstand 15,000 miles a year, but 250,000 miles a year. And the interior will be churned out every six to 12 months. And that's a flow-on effect for all, everybody else. So it's not dire for the OEM industry if they're, if they're willing to change. If they're willing to change, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty much pretty exciting stuff. You know, what's related to this, I just want to raise one, one question that we had posed actually in the invite that we haven't really hit here, which yeah. is you were worried about this, this general tech backlash and to what right. extent that backlash would retard or screw up this kind of trajectory. And it kind of relates to the legacy thing. So there's these new upstart tech companies that mm -hmm. used to you know, be totally golden and everyone thinks is awesome. Now there is some serious pushback. Right. Uh, we even heard it tonight a little bit. Um, how worried are you about that, that they'll, they'll, this autonomous vehicle kind of shared transport world will essentially get caught into some kind of public yeah. backlash and kind of the wrong public policy coming to kind of muck it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally not worried about the technology companies. They'll, they'll figure themselves out. Okay, okay, you know, they're okay, they're okay. kind of like rising phoenixes. They'll, they'll crash, burn, and rise again. So this okay. thing, this okay, thing okay. has reinvented itself over and over again. It just now is becoming, the f it's in a form of autonomous vehicle. Before that, it was a smartphone. Before that, it was computing. So it'll reinvent itself. And then the next thing is wellness and and bio uh, mimicry, et cetera, it's, it's going to do its thing. So I'm not worried about them at all, okay. frankly. Okay, okay. I'm more worried about how we as a society actually adopt and address the existing issues of that transportation system and then get it ready for the new stuff coming in. That's where it's not clear to me. There is the, there is the people in one camp that are, we're victims, we don't want anything to change, don't come near us. And there's the other, there's other camp of it, this is the best thing since sliced bread, shiny new toy, it's, it's utopia. And we need to have some middle saying, yes, we hear these concerns, we hear the opportunities, but what does it look like for our, for our region? And, and what are the things we want? At the same time, looking at our existing systems and saying, this no longer serves, we need to let that go. This actually is important, we need to elevate that up. You know, our transportation system, if we're going to be honest, was actually used to exclude people, uh, mainly of race and gender, um, for the last 50 years. We have to address that, because we can just make this even worse. So these are really hard things that we need to address, and it's not stuff that I take lightly. I've studied for, for years about this stuff on how to address all the inequities, and those inequities are real, and we need to figure out ways to actually address it. AV technology could be a part of the solution, but it's not the solution. You know, this, many of the different things we need to do are policy, they're not even technological, they're just, we need to address some of these inequities in our policies we have. And yet, you remain optimistic. Cautiously, Cautiously optimistic. optimistic. Yeah, because humans are, uh, we persevere, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it.
I like that attitude. Yeah. I tell you what, that's a good place to stop. I know there's other questions, but we're actually stay here. We got some more food, some drink. Tim's here. You can ask the questions if you didn't get to ask it. Meet your peers. A lot of folks know a lot of things in this room. And uh, let's have a big round of applause for Tim. And give this to that. And just to remind you, we're on a quarterly basis, so don't wig out if you didn't get the invite <laughs> for the next uh, month. But it'll, we'll be coming back with uh, what will be an awesome next, uh, next quarter. So, uh, but anyway, hang out, and uh, we'll see you next time. Awesome.